Good morning, and welcome to Beyond Spring's fourth quarter and year-end 2021 financial results conference call. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Following management's prepared remarks, we will hold a brief question and answer session. As a reminder, this call is being recorded today, April 14, 2022. I will now turn the call over to Ashley Sergio of Lifestyle Advisors. Thank you, everyone, for joining today's call. I would like to advise listeners that comments made on today's call may reflect forward-looking statements that are related to such matters as Beyond Spring's clinical and preclinical research and development activities and results, regulatory and commercial plan, industry trends, market potential, collaborative initiatives, and other financial projections, among others. While management believes that its assumptions, expectations, and projections are reasonable in the view of the currently available information, you are cautioned not to place undue reliance on these forward-looking statements. The company's actual results may differ materially from those discussed during this call for a variety of reasons, including those described in the forward-looking statements and risk factors sections of the company's 20F and other filings with the SEC, which are available on the investors section of Beyond Springs website. Joining us on today's call is Dr. Lan Huang, Beyond Springs co-founder, chairman, and chief executive officer, Dr. Ramon Mahanlal, executive vice president, research and development, and chief medical officer, and Elizabeth Serpak, chief financial officer. It is now my pleasure to turn the call over to Dr. Lan Huang. Lan? Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining today's call. It's a pleasure to be here today reporting our fourth quarter and year-end results and providing an update on our progress in the past few months. After the complete response letter from the US FDA last November, we took steps to streamline our operations in order to extend the cash runway. Now we are focused on executing near-term opportunities for value creation. First, we are pleased with our ongoing discussions with China NMPA on the review of Panavalence NDA in combination with GCSF for the prevention of chemotherapy-induced neutropenia, or CIS. The GCSF market in China is significant with $1.2 $1.2 billion in sales in 2020 and around 30% annual growth since 2017. In addition, we continue our discussions with the FDA regarding the clinical and regulatory pathway for panavalent in CIN in the U.S. Second, moving to our panavalent program in non small lung cancer, where we announced in August and September 2021 at ASMO conference positive top-line data from our Phase 3 doubling 3 study. In the second and third line, non sponsored lung cancer with EGFR white type, which represents severe unmet medical needs with limited treatment options, cannabalin and docetaxel combinations showed significant improvement in overall survivor, especially in doubling the two-year and three-year survivor rate compared to docetaxel alone. We believe the data supports the role of panabolin as a potential anti-cancer treatment option in this indication. We are moving forward to target an NDA filing in China by year end. Dr. Ramon Mohano, our Chief Medical Officer, will provide additional details during his remarks shortly. Finally, we continue to develop panablin as a potential pipeline in the drug. Using cost-effective investigator-initiated studies, we continue our development plans for panablin in immuno-oncology combinations in various cancers to target unmet medical needs in patients who have failed PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibitors. 
we continue to see strong interest by investigators and will share additional data and updates as they become available. Overall, we are proud of the support we have received as we continue our efforts to bring Panabolin to market. One of our validating steps was announcing last fall a strategic partnership between Ventrin Bulin, our 58% owned China subsidiary, and Tyre Pharmaceuticals, a leading oncology R&D and commercialization company in China for the development and commercialization of Panabolin in greater China. Tenre is a well-respected company with over 10,000 salespeople in China. In 2020, the company had $4.2 billion in sales, of which $2.4 billion was for oncology drug sales. In addition, Tenre has a leading market position with its long-acting GCSF in China. In September 2021, we receive a 200 million renminbi, estimated to be around $31 million up from payment from Henry, and will be eligible to receive up to 1.1 billion renminbi, estimated to be $171 million in regulatory and sales milestones. We will receive all proceeds from sales of Panabolin products and pay Henry a predetermined percentage of such sales. We will provide updates on commercialization plans as we get closer to potential approval in China. In conclusion, we remain committed in bringing Panabolin to market. As Panabolin has a long patent life with patent protection to 2037 in 40 jurisdictions, which includes 19 granted patents in the U.S., we would have a long runway to realize Panabolin's potential to help many patients in need. One more note, we are making good progress in our subsidiary, Seed Therapeutics. Seed focuses on differentiated molecular glue technology in the targeted protein degradation field. We signed R&D collaboration agreement on a number of targets with Eli Lilly in November 2020. Now I will turn the call over to Dr. Ramon Mohano, our Chief Medical Officer, for some additional details on our development programs. Ramon. Thank you, Lang. I would like to make the following comments regarding the CIM program. First, we firmly believe that a drug works in CIM prevention. We have clinical evidence that planabin increases neutrophil count through a rapid mechanism of action acting within 24 hours after chemotherapy. This clinical evidence was presented at ASH last year. Second, we have positive data in every single clinical study for CIM that we have conducted, totaling over 1,200 patients in these studies. The data has led to multiple presentations at leading scientific conferences, as well as publications in highly regarded peer-reviewed journals. And third, although we have positive clinical trial data, we do fall short in satisfying the US FDA's requirement to receive approval at this time. In that, more data will be needed. A second phase three CIM study will be required, and we are currently in discussions with the US FDA to align on the design of this study. We are highly committed to bring in clonablin for CIM prevention to the market, to provide doctors the tools to better protect their patients against CIM, which continues to be a condition with unmet medical needs. 
Today, CIN continues to cause preventable mortality and suboptimal cancer treatment due to chemotherapy dose reductions necessitated by the occurrence of severe leukopenia. Moving on to non-small cell lung cancer, I would like to make the following point. Firstly, we firmly believe that the drug works in non-small cell lung cancer, as well as other cancer indications. We have strong mechanistic evidence that planablin has a dual mechanism of action in cancer. Firstly, planablin has immune enhancing effects that enable the immune system to better fight off the cancer. Secondly, planablin has direct anti-cancer effects as a single agent in a number of cancer types. The second point I would like to make. We have positive clinical trial data in the phase 3 in 3 study in non-small cell lung cancer and in the phase 1 trial in small cell lung cancer conducted with the Big Ten Consortium. Data from these trials were presented at ASCO and ASCO last year, respectively. Notably, in the non-small cell lung cancer trial, we had more surviving patients over a time span of four years with the planablin plus dose of cell combination compared to standard of care dose of cell. In the small cell lung cancer trial, the addition of planablin to nivolumab and ipilimumab more than doubled objective response rate, ORR, at more than 40% compared to resource controls of nivolumab and ipilimumab alone. Of note, we still have one patient in the trial who failed a prior checkpoint inhibitor and yet continues to benefit from planablin after more than 58 cycles, which for second-line small cell lung cancer is highly exceptional. The third point I would like to make regarding the path to approval, what is relevant is the patient population of the trial. In Dublin 3, around 87% of the data was derived from China. This has brought into question whether this data set is applicable to the US population with our US FDA discussion. This is a topic that not only affects us, it affects many companies that have derived their data primarily from China. In the February ODAC meeting, the review of a BLA for Centilimab, the FDA committee publicly noted that while it was convinced about the efficacy and safety of the data presented, they would require additional data that is applicable to the U.S. population. Having around 87% of the patients derived from China, however, is a distinct advantage for obtaining approval in China as the data is highly applicable for Chinese patients. The NDA filing for non-small cell lung cancer in China will therefore be our near-term priority. We, however, will remain committed to continuing our clinical and regulatory discussions in the U.S. and other regions. In addition to the development of planablin in CIM and non-small cell lung cancer, we are developing planablin and immunotherapy combinations through a number of phase 1-2 IIT trials that are currently ongoing, and we will share that data as we receive it. With that, I will now turn the call over to Elizabeth, our CFO, for a review of our financials. Elizabeth? Thank you, Ramon. 
I will now briefly discuss our fourth quarter and year-end 2021 financial results. For greater detail to these results, I refer you to our press release issued this morning and to our 20F filing, both of which can be accessed under the Investors section of our website. With that, I will now highlight some of the key financial results. R&D expenses in the fourth quarter of 2021 were $5.8 million, compared to $8.4 million in the same period last year. The decrease of $2.6 million was primarily due to lower clinical development expenses and personnel costs, including non-cash share-based compensation expenses which were partially offset by higher preclinical and professional expenses. G&A expenses were 5.0 million in the fourth quarter of 2021 and included a non-cash credit of 2.0 million related to the reversal of share-based compensation expense. This compares to 10.4 million for the prior year, which included $2.1 million in non-recurring personnel costs. The decrease was primarily driven by lower share-based compensation expense. The net loss attributable to the company in the fourth quarter of 2021 was $9.5 million compared to $17.6 million for the same period last year. For the full year 2021, R&D expenses were $36.9 million, compared to $41.8 million for the prior year. The $4.9 million decrease was primarily due to lower clinical development expense and non-cash share-based compensation expense, partially offset by higher personnel costs, preclinical, and professional services expenses, as well as a $2.9 million NDA application fee paid to FDA, which is expected to be refunded during the second quarter of 2022. G&A expenses for the full year 2021 were $30.7 million, compared to $22.6 million for the prior year. The majority of the $8.1 million increase was due to higher pre-commercialization expenses for planabulin, which we do not expect to continue this year. There were also increases in personnel costs administrative expenses, and other costs, which were partially offset by lower non-cash share-based compensation expense. The net loss attributable to the company for the full year was $64.2 million, compared to $61.0 million for the prior year. Our cash balance at December 31, 2021, was $41.6 million, and we had short-term investments of $30.7 million for a total of $72.4 million, which we believe will be sufficient to support our ongoing operations and clinical programs over the next year. With that, I'll now turn the call back over to Juan for closing remarks. Juan? Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you to everyone who is on the call for your strong support. We are fully committed to bring Panavalin to market to help many patients in need, and we continue to believe in its great potential. I would like to open the call for Q&A now. Operator? Thank you. We'll now be conducting a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question today, Please press star 1 from your telephone keypad, and a confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. 
You may press star 2 if you would like to remove your question from the queue. For participants that are using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. One moment, please, while we poll for questions. Thank you. Thank you. And our first question is from the line of Maury Raycroft with Jeffries. Please proceed with your question. Hi, good morning. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. Um, I wanted to check on the uh, China uh, approval for CIN. Um, you've mentioned that you're in on, ongoing discussions with China's NMPA for CIN. What kind of feedback on a potential approval decision have you received so far, and is there an update on what the time frame for approval could look like? Oh, thank you so much, uh, Maury, and thank you for supporting us over the years. Uh, so the CIN NDA application is currently under independent review with the China NMPA. As you see, actually, I'm currently in China to work with our China team on the review process. So far, we have had multiple positive meetings with CDE, which is the Center of Drug Evaluation in the NMPA, and we remain hopeful of the potential approval in China. But as also you know, anything dealing with regulatory process has its inherent uncertainties. However, our optim optimism is based on the strong data generated in Asian patients in the 106 phase three study. And we will provide the progress of the discussions with China and MPA in due course. Okay, understood. And um, um, for non-small cell lung, well, for CIN in the um, United States, you mentioned running an additional study. Um, can you elaborate on conversations with FDA on what the additional study in CIN could look like and when that could start? Yeah, so I would just turn this question to Ramon. Ramon, would you like to answer this? Yes, thank you, Lan. Uh, yes, this is an important question, uh, and uh, we ha have active discussions uh, ongoing with the US FDA on the design of that study. Uh, when we have more clarity, then, of course, we will disclose that, but, but we are uh, actively discussing this study. Understood. And then maybe last question for me, just for non-small cell lung cancer, is there still a path forward in the United States? Um, and uh, when will you learn more about what that path could look like? Yes. So also for non-small cell lung cancer, we are in active discussions with the US FDA. Uh, those discussions are ongoing. Uh, obviously, as I mentioned, the data is positive and will remain to be positive. Uh, I also pointed out that uh, most of the data was derived from the, the Chinese population, uh, which uh, is an important topic in, in our uh, discussions with the US FDA. Got it. Okay. I guess, I guess um, would uh, another study be needed there, or could the IO studies potentially expand in um, and would that be more of the, the path forward for non-small cell lung cancer? So, so non-small cell lung cancer, second and third line, is, is still tremendous on that med medical need because you will be aware that most of the IO agents have moved into first line, uh, which in, in essence creates an opportunity in second and third line, uh, and that's where we are positioned. So we have positive data with one study, and uh, this discussions are ongoing, uh, regarding uh, also positioning in second and third line, but separately also, as, as you uh, as you indicate, uh, our interest also is uh, in, in first line with, with a number of uh, IO combinations. We, we are active on, on both fronts, uh, focus on second and third line, but also uh, strong attention uh, to first line with IO combinations. Okay. Okay. Thanks for taking my questions. Thank you so much, Mari. Our next question comes from the line of Jason Gerbery with Bank of America. Please proceed with your questions. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Chi on for Jason. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, I guess the first one's on the 
U.S. non-small cell filing. Um, I just want to confirm if the second half 2022 filing guidance is off the table right now as you continue discussion with the FDA. And I'm curious if you have any sort of early feedback from the FDA about, you know, what's the gating factor for the U.S. filing. I understand there's sort of the dynamic of evolving FDA view about the preference for multi-regional clinical trials. I'm curious if that's sort of the the the, the, uh, the driver for that discussion. And um, and and I guess thirdly, um, there is uh, at the Lilly's uh, Innovant Edcom. I think one thing the FDA took issue with sort of data generating in China was based on a, an older report several years ago, I think from 2016, that maybe there's some data compromise in China trials. And one of the questions they asked the sponsors there were if there's any overlap with their trial size compared to, you know, what is documented in that 2016 report. I understand there are like, you know, a few years have gone by, things have changed, but I'm just curious if there's any overlap between your trial size and that list of China trials listed in that uh, document. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Chief. Probably I can answer this quickly because Ramon has answered a lot on the non-sponsor lung cancer previously. So first is, yeah, we confirm that the second half of 2022 filing for non-sponsor lung cancer is for China. Uh, for the U.S., uh, I think the current uh, discussion is around the uh, relevance of the Wall Street patient population to the U.S. Uh, patients. So thanks for asking the question regarding the uh, PD-1 agent from Lilly and Innovent, that ODAC meeting. But as we know that as China do uh, provide uh, good data with the GCP uh, qualities, so we do not see any issues with our data as we also use ICON, which is a global CIO, to conduct the study globally. Uh, in China, there are 30 sites there. Uh, for, you know, they're all very well-respected sites which has passed the uh, uh, NMPA inspections. So we, we, we are very confident with the quality of our data from China. Got it. And if I may just ask one quick follow-up, has the FDA sort of initiated a conversation that you may need a second trial uh, with some flavor of multi-regional representation? Or has that discussion not come up yet? No, this this discussion did not come up. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Joel Beatty with Baird. Please proceed with your question. Hi, thanks for taking the questions. The first one is on CIN in the U.S. And you mentioned that there will be a second study needed there. Um, for clarity, could you point out which study the FDA considers as the first study for that setting? Well, thank you so much, Joe, and thanks for your support. And this is a great question. So the first study would be considered is the 1663 study. We are seeking a combination label. Make, make sense. And has, has FDA explicitly said that they consider that study to be a success? I think they considered this uh, efficacious uh, data. Oh, okay, so it sounds like um, may maybe they've, they've had a positive tone. Yeah, it would still be a review issue at a future point in time. Yes, but Currently, we use the WOW 6 phase 3 interim data at Chicago's the breakthrough, and the final data is consistent with the interim data, which is a positive data from the primary endpoint, and also we show the relevant clinical um, benefit in the combination compared to the Pac-Gaston alone. So that is efficacious, okay. and also it's uh, safe uh, from from, from what we see from the data on Panavala in, in this uh, CIN dose. Uh, Ramon, you want to add a little bit more? Well, if not, um, did I answer your question, Joe? 
Yeah, yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Ramon. Uh, so, sorry, I was on mute. No, no, I, I uh, uh, would like to add. Uh, study 106 is a combination study with Tenevlin and Paxilgustin. Uh, we met the primary endpoint. The data is positive. Uh, the data is positive in many different directions. So that, as a study uh, on its own, is, is a positive study. Obviously, uh, with a new concept, a new paradigm, with a combination approach in CIN, uh, the FDA would like to have a level of robustness, what we already have uh, communicated with you. Uh, and uh, to, to reach that level of robustness, a second study will be needed. Uh, the way the data will be looked at is, of course, uh, in, in totality, uh, once that data of the second study has been uh, obtained. Uh, those discussions are ongoing with the US FDA, uh, in particular regarding the design of that second study. Got it, thanks for that. And maybe switching to non-small cell lung cancer in the US, for a, a trial to support that indication, would it be a matter of conducting a trial similar to Dublin III but with U.S. and global patients, you know, or, or would there be differences in trial design compared to Dublin III? So a second study is not mentioned within our discussion with the U.S. FDA. So the the current, uh, you know, discussion point is the relevance of the one three study for the U.S. population. But even as you see from the ODAC meeting with uh, FDA um, of this PD-1 from in November in Lily, FDA did say there is a certain regulatory flexibility in three parts. Number one is you know, our medical needs. Number two is rare disease. And potentially our drug is not in the rare disease point. But number three is novel mode of action. And penavalent does have novel mode of action, so potentially that's that's an area of um, you know, interest as well. I see, got it. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Joe Penkinis with H.C. Wainwright. Please proceed with your question. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, thanks for taking the question. So I wanted to just focus on CIN as well. So uh, let's start with China. So I just wanted to get a sense, what's the role that Hung Rei is playing in the regulatory filing discussions in China? And um, maybe a little more detail, as, as you feel as part of your discussions, as what you uh, currently view as the rate-limiting steps. Oh, thank you so much, Joe. Thanks for the great question. So Hung Rei is really an ideal partner for us in China because they have many drugs approved uh, in China and also a lot of them are innovative drugs. So currently we are working together to prepare the answers for the NMPA review questions and do, they also do attend uh, the meetings with us for with the CDE. And, and are there anything to so, point to as what the key po uh, factor is that still needs to be addressed? Oh, we're still answering some of the review questions from the uh, CFDA, the NMPA. So after those questions are answered, and then they will have final review. Yeah, I understand. But it's a stepwise approach. Sure, sure. Thank you for that. And then uh, regarding the FDA, I, I can certainly um, respect and understand, obviously, not being able to provide any guidance regarding, you know, the design or scope of the second study. So I guess I'll ask this question, and I'm not sure if you can answer it at this point. Um, you know, what are the chances that Beyond Spring will conduct this study on your own versus uh, someone else or in partnership? Well, after the design is done, I think we plan to do it ourselves. If there's a partner coming along, I think we'll also be happy to do it together. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. There are no further questions. I'll now turn the call over to Dr. Wang for her closing remarks. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining the call today, and thank you for your strong support. Uh, we will keep you posted in our upcoming progresses. Thank you, and have a nice day. This will conclude today's conference. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect your lines at this time.